And now we're, we are live. All right. Welcome to the meeting. We'll go ahead and open the meeting at 5.05 p.m. Uh, the governance board encourages public discussion of all items on the agenda. Anyone wishing to address the board may submit a comment form prior to the start of the agenda item discussion. Comment forms will not be accepted for any of the items once the item has been announced. 
A person wishing to address the board shall first be recognized by the president and shall then proceed to comment as briefly as the subject permits. There is a three minute maximum speaking time per person on single agenda item. The limit on discussing each item is 20 minutes. Board bylaw 9323 states the board cannot comment on a non-agenda item. However, the matter may be placed on the agenda of a subsequent meeting for action or discussion by the board per, per the Brown Act. <clears throat> Please be advised our meeting is being recorded. Uh, are there any public comments on closed session items? The closed session items are item 2A, public employee appointment pursuant to government code 54947, and 2B, public employee discipline dismissal release pursuant to government code 54947. Item 2C, conference with labor negotiator pursuant to government code 54957.9. Negotiator Mauling Barnes, Employees Organization, Sonola AFT Chapter 1494 Local, CSEA Chapter 862, and Management Classified Employees. Item 2D, Public Employee Performance Evaluation for the Superintendent. Okay, we'll go ahead and dismiss to closed session. We'll see you.
quarter. It is 6.16. Welcome. It's great to have everybody here. Uh, uh, let's see. We will go ahead and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> So I want to welcome everyone here. And, uh, I just want to share a couple of things. Um, first, we'll get the business out of the way. The governing board encourages public discussion of all items on the agenda. Anyone wishing to address the board may submit a comment form prior to the start of the agenda item. Uh, comment forms will not be accepted for any items once the item has been announced. A person wishing to address the board shall first be recognized by the president and shall then proceed to comment as briefly as the subject permits up here at the front. There is a three-minute <coughs> maximum speaking time per person on a single agenda item. We will be sticking to that. The limit on discussing each item is 20 minutes. We will be sticking to that. The board bylaw 9323 states that the board cannot comment on a non-agenda item However, the matter may be placed on the agenda of a subsequent meeting for action or discussion by the board per the Brown Act. Uh, please be advised, our meeting is being recorded and broadcast. Uh, I'm glad that everyone is here. It's good to have public discussion. It's good to have comments, and we welcome that. Um, please keep it civil. Please, if you can, turn your cell phones off. Please avoid side talking, side chatter. It's a small room. It can get hot. It can get, the language can get heated. We'd like to avoid that. I, my name is Ryan Jurgensen. I am the president for the year for the board. I have four children that go to this school. I very much care about how the school is run, and I love this school. I think it's being run fabulously. I also believe in fair open discourse, fair debate, proper governance. My agenda, personally, is to keep this school going in a healthy, good direction, to keep it safe and kind for all. I hope that that is the agenda of the board, and we try to come to a consensus and move forward. Um, personally, I try not to speak a lot on the particular issues to not get too politicized. And I am very glad that my children so far report that a lot of this, they're completely unaware of it. Good. I'm glad. I am glad that teachers are keeping it out of the school. I hope that parents will try to do the same. Yeah. I believe that <clears throat> the, right, the right to free speech, our First Amendment right is important, but hate speech is not a protected right if it's demeaning on the basis of age, race, ethnicity, gender, disability, etc., The right to free speech is not just to protect your right or my right. It's also to protect the speech of those we don't agree with. And we can disagree agreeably. Now, I have, and the board, I assume, I've seen there's been a lot of emails going around. I've received more emails this week than I've ever received while being on the board. And that's fine. I read them all. I can't respond to them all. Um, and a lot of them express views and opinions, but don't ask a question. There have been a couple of emails where someone asks a short, quick question. I'll reply to those. My email is public. It's on the website. Feel free to email. I don't know if the other board members feel the same, but they might. So feel free to reach out. We're not scary people. We're trying to do good for our students, and that is our main goal. <clears throat> that there's difference of opinion. So, with that being said, I don't mean to grandstand or to try to make my thoughts anybody else's thoughts. But we we uh, we love this school. We all love this school. That's why we're here. So let's try to keep that in mind. We're here for the students, for the kids. <clears throat> the uh, first thing we'd like to do is report out on the closed session agenda. Uh, there was one item. Sorry, while well, I pull this up, and I handed it to Mickey already. 
Yeah. 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 Without status change, no, not this one. Uh, status change for two uh, employees that's going from probationary to permanent. It is Miss Horton, Carly Horton. I'm going based off of memory because I don't have the paper in front of me. And Miss Rachel Malgeri. And that was approved uh, with a unanimous vote by all three board members. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing we approved is uh, an evaluation. Uh, it's quite lengthy. It's six pages, three pages front and back. I will just read the letter at the beginning of it, which is our evaluation as a board of Ms. Moline Barnes, our fabulous superintendent. The board is pleased that Sonol Glen continues to be a school of choice for Sonol residents as well as for neighboring communities. While the school has faced a year of significant challenges, from recovery from the pandemic to a once every 100 years flood, the school and the school community remain strong in large part due to the tremendous leadership of Mrs. Barnes. Her emphasis this year to bring together from students and classrooms to parents and community members coming together <clears throat> to help the school in hours of need has brought cohesion and positive advancement to the school. Mrs. Barnes active leadership during the following, during and following the New Year's Eve flood event warrants special commendation. She not only jumped into action during the holiday period to get the school fit for students to return after the Christmas break, with only a week to do so, she also galvanized the community to help repair the school, including working with the community club to raise thousands of dollars in donations for the school, as well as working with County Supervisor David Halbert to organize the Sonol Glen Cleanup Day, which brought together over 300 volunteers to clean up the play structure, fields, and garden that were damaged by the flood. And not stopping there, she has continued to actively lead the charge on seeking out donations and governmental funding for repair work to the school. Beyond flood remediation, Mrs. Barnes separately has taken on managing the implementation <clears throat> of the school's Measure J bond program, successfully raising $3 million in March 2023 to begin the various necess necessary repairs to the school's aging infrastructure. And throughout all of this, Mrs. Barnes has maintained a clear focus on advancing what is best for the students of Snow Glen, in particular in-person teaching, engagement, and events, such as the first indoor student concert since 2019. She <clears throat> continues to implement a holistic, inclusive philosophy of actively seeking out the best ways to teach students and support their educational development, while showing the compassion and attention to individual needs a small school such as Snow Glen can provide. At her direction, teachers are highlighting and students are adopting good character and active positive citizenship. It is clearly paying off as students were motivated to raise over $45,000 this year through the first in-person walkathon in several years. At the same time, she has kept teacher development at the forefront too. In particular, teachers have been able to receive in-person professional development <clears throat> through the programs offered by the teacher on special assignment, the grant for whom Mrs. Barnes was able to secure. Lastly, Mrs. Barnes has been astute in engaging the community from parents of students to the larger Sonol citizenry. She has worked hard to keep parents informed of fast changing events, such as the closure of the school due to wind caused power outage, to keeping the community informed about the school's flood damage and repair needs. She even was able to garner media and public support for the school through press events and various local television news broadcasters shining a needed light on the school when statewide weather events might otherwise overwhelm <laughs> continued interest in small schools such as Sonol Glen. This even brought the attention and support of our congressional and state assembly representatives. The board finds Mrs. Barnes effective in all her many roles, including in engaging with the board and responding to its needs in a timely fashion. The board is looking forward to continuing its positive working relationship with Mrs. Barnes <clears throat> and learning from her experience as the members of the board come up to speed on many new issues and areas of K through eight education over the coming year. We then uh, detail, and I won't go through all the details of some of the school's uh, goals, commendations, recommendations, and we give her uh, this letter and this evaluation of commendation and gratitude.
mean, we are an institution at Seminole Glen. You guys, everybody here knows we can't do this alone. This is all a, a group effort. We're, we're a team, close knit family. It's all that synergy of positive. We can do this. My favorite thing to talk about is on January 1st when this was happening. I talked to a couple people on January 2nd, and they're like, when are you opening, Molly? And I said, we're opening January 9th. Oh, no, no, you're not going to open on January 9th. I go, you don't know Snow Glen. <laughs> you don't know the people that work here. And we will be, I got Mr. Hoxie, I got Cheryl, I got Nikki, I got these three here. We're going to open. And we did. And people were shocked. They, they just said, with the amount of damage, there's just no way we're going to open. And we did. So anyway, I just thank the, everybody because it, it couldn't be here without you all. So thank you very much. And thank you for this. Thank you. Showing up on my fridge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, action item, uh, sorry, no, item number five is the approval of the agenda. Uh, is there the any motion? With the exception of one, I want to withdraw the 8B. You want to make a motion to withdraw 8B? Okay, yeah. and any reason why? Yes, well, there's a number of reasons, but the 1078 has totally changed from when I originally... Okay. Many, many um, school districts up and down the state had written in not supporting it because it was taking away local control. And we would lose our ability as a school district to make many decisions. And so for that reason, they withdrew it and have rewritten it. And so now <coughs> it stands for the most part in a totally different form. So, and I had wanted to discuss 1314 mostly in around the, um, the fact that Teachers and schools are being caught in the crossfire, and a lot of lawsuits are ensuing. And I wanted to be able to have an uh, open conversation that I don't think that that's possible. So we're going to scrap it. Okay. So um, you made a motion to remove 8B from the uh, agenda. Okay. Um, I think that would be great for us to not discuss it. Um, I am second that motion, and we can go ahead and put that to a. Do we need to put it to a vote to remove something from the agenda? You're now approving the agenda with the amendment. Oh, okay. okay. So, amendment the, uh, amendment. Uh, yes. So, so uh, make a motion that we approve the agenda without item eight B. Okay. Right. Okay. So, uh, just for uh, clarification, eight B is obviously a controversial uh, one to discuss. Um, Trustee uh, Hurley asks that that be discussed, but as she mentioned, things have changed. If you have written, uh, fill out one of these forms to speak on that agenda item, we won't be discussing that agenda item. Um, and if you would like to fill out another form to speak on another agenda item or on item seven, you may do that. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and just to reiterate, that is something that Trustee Hurley wanted to put on the agenda, and she has asked to take it off. It kind of makes sense since it doesn't really relate to our school district. So, uh, so we will go ahead with <laughs> item 6A, uh, enrollment report. Just a process check. So I just yeah. want to clarify, um, the agenda is advertised three days in advance, and if folks came and filled it out. There's two ways that you can comment, and one is you comment on an agenda item, and then the other way is you can comment on an item not on the agenda. And so if you still feel moved to speak, now that item, when the agenda was approved, now that item is off. So if you filled out, as, as our president um, Jurgensen said, if you filled out right here, there is there no, is no longer a fee. If you, but it doesn't preclude you from filling out a card for an item not on the agenda. If you still want to share your thoughts, you would do that form. And then you do that, let me tell you when you do that, you would do it, I think, right on seven. seven. And when we get to seven, it's community Open. comments from the community, and you can say, I want to talk on whatever. The board can't reply because it's now not on the agenda, but you certainly have the right to share your thoughts. And, so that 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 and that is, that agenda item will still be limited to three minutes yeah. per person and twenty minutes of time for that item. So six as a point of order, pardon me. 
I, I don't think anybody here could hear the reason for the board members removal of that item. And just as, a, as an open meeting, it's so, important for us all to be able to hear. So the, the reason is Trustee Hurley wanted to discuss that for various different reasons. Um, she has stated she does not care to discuss that at this meeting any longer. Uh, part of the reason she gave was because one of those is no longer even being considered at the state level, and the other one has been changed uh, quite drastically. And frankly, I don't really care to discuss it. I don't think it applies to our school and is not something that we need to get into. Um, Thank so you. yeah, we're, we're not proposing adopting anything. That's why we're not gonna have that agenda item on there. So, all right, so 6A enrollment report. All right, so I have this has not happened in a while, and especially at the end of the year, we actually had two kids move into Sonol and join our school, and it's May. So they come in the really hardcore learning, okay, there's field day and heroes day, it's all kinds of fun, teacher appreciation weeks, uh, but there is learning going on. I just want to let the record show, there's lots of learning going on. But we moved up to 272, woohoo! We love it, we love it. They're a great, great family for our town. Uh, great students for us to uh, include as well. Mm -hmm. I'm a sixth grader and I believe a second grader. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 6B, superintendent's report and flooded update. All right, so I'm back on. Um, in May, is super, April, May, there's a lot going on. Um, as was referenced in my um, lovely evaluation, we do have a, a huge value on character education, and we celebrate different character traits every Oh, sorry, that was me. Of all of those who just want to celebrate good citizenship. So, Old Glenn is loving the hug from our fabulous volunteers on this this year's past Earth Day. And I don't know if she's here. A huge thank you to Erin Chowen. Erin, you just have this vision. And if you, if you see Erin with a vision, I will say to you, step aside. Because she has a vision, she's got it, she's going. And um, we, uh, it was so beautiful because as our, the flood, there's been some areas that have some much needed TLC. And so the garden and the front of the school, um, volunteers came on April 22nd and worked really hard distributing mulch so that our beloved school shines even brighter. So thank you, Earth Day volunteers. And she had a whole crew of people, so thank you. Um, the bond update, uh, we're gonna go into the bond a, a little bit more in one of our items here in a minute, G, I think. But um, my, my quick update, I want to thank those folks that stepped forward to be part of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. And uh, we have a nice gamut of folks, a couple of people I've never met before, so it was great to have some new faces here. Um, the first meeting was on Thursday, April 27th, and it provided an orientation for all the members. And it was led by Courtney Jones, our bond attorney. They selected their officers. I believe Chris Poberts was voluntold. I mean, excited to be <laughs> the chair. Aaron Choin is our vice chair, and Lisa Ball is the secretary. Um, it was just an orientation trying to give the, the, the what their role is in the box. And um, our next meeting is scheduled for November 30th. The recommendation is to meet annually, but our group felt like annually seems so far away. And we're right there into the beginning of this, so we thought, it would be nicer if we could meet in six months rather than 12 months. The FEMA meetings, FEMA is super fun. If you ever want to do something really fun, I would say you can learn about FEMA. Yeah. It's really easy to navigate through yeah. everything. It makes perfect sense. Very logical. Okay, none of that is true. Uh -oh. And I know I'm being recorded. It is. It is something else, that piece. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it's it, yeah. We had a list. Here's damage. Here's the price. Here's what we're gonna do. 
And they're like, oh, that's fabulous, that's fabulous. None of this works for the grant. You have to pull it apart and say this, and this goes with this area. And that goes that. It's, it makes no sense, and it's a lot of work. And a huge shout out to our very own County Clark. Yay. Yay. She, she actually looked at me and straight, and her face was straight. She said, I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah, she gets it. So you're, you're getting all those channels and series and why. Um, but it's a lot of work. Uh, the good news is that they do assign you a person. And our, our gal is Glenda Hickman, and she is from Texas, and she'll tell you. And she's really, really helpful. She does understand this stuff. I don't, I don't understand how she does, but she does. And she's really good at directing us. So it's taken several meetings. I think that we, we just finished our fifth or sixth meeting. And um, you can see how laborious it is and how long it takes, because the flood was January 1st, and here we are, May. So the May 4th meeting, we were finally able to close out, I believe, three of our areas. And the reason that's really critical and celebratory is once you close an area, it then goes through their process of approval, which then will um, get, deliver some funds. Yep. And obviously, you can't close something until that you have invoices to prove that you've done complete the, the work. So we had that um, Mr. Hoxie's office and Mr. Barnes' office and the storage areas up there in the 300 wing were damaged from the flood and we were able to get work done and that was closed so we could close that portal on that and reach out for grants. The other one was uh, RMC, which is Restoration Management Company. You guys probably all saw him, them here running around right on the January 2nd, just inventory everything, making sure there's no the moisture control in all the rooms, no, no mold, um, all of that, uh, doing all that assessment work um and that was for over a hundred thousand dollars and they're, they invoice us and they're done what's nice is the first the work that happens during the emergency session which is the first hundred days is eligible for a hundred percent reimbursement so we will get those funds back which is phenomenal after that the other work that will be occurring we're eligible for 75 percent reimbursement of that work which is going to include temporary portables permanent portables and some of the other work that's happening and then um, the Cal, Cal OES, so they'll, FEMA will pay 75% after the 100 days. Cal OES, so the district is responsible for the other 25%. Cal OES, which is the California arm of FEMA, <laughs> yeah, uh, Office of Emergency Services, right? They'll, they'll pay 75% of our 25%. So it's, it's a really great program because for an emergency situation that was beyond the school's control and have this kind of damage. The nice news is it looks like we're going to get some, a lot of the, the funds re, replaced for us and buildings fixed. So that's the nice. playground. Thank you. Yeah, the playground was a, that was a separate category, but yes, yes, the, the playground, the track that needs to be redone, um, garden. We listed everything. Um, the kiln, believe it or not, is still working, which is crazy. Um, but if there's something, if there's a part of it that needs to be rebuilt or something, that we can claim all of that. So she's really good about wanting us to claim, you know, everything. Building up the fence line, replacing the fence, that's something that is mitigating the, the flood. So it's, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it in the end. And another thing that's worth it at the end is FEMA really wants to make sure we put in measures to mitigate this from this happening again. That's part of the dealio. Like in order to have those portables back up here, they want it so that they won't be flooded again. So that they'll pay, but we got to build up the foundation. So it's kind of it's kind of a nice thing. It's just very time consuming. Um, I want to thank Mr. Louder. I don't know if he's here, but he brought up to us um, a few weeks ago, months ago, that there's a desire to revisit our absence program parents reporting when their children are absences are absent and we follow the ed code which is basically medical medical dentist um ill going to the doctors those are the kinds of things that allow you to have an excused absence everything else is pretty much unexcused but he did share that at pleasanton they have a new, a new form that they put into place we have a wonderful relationship with pleasanton our kids the little kids go to school is in pleasanton so we always like to hear what they're doing and adopt if we can so we'll be talking about that and it's part on the agenda's 8G, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that to my uh, share out as well and to thank Mr. Lauer because he was great. He was like, well, here, here's a district that's doing it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's always good to not have to reinvent the wheel and their form was great. We're, gonna, we're just gonna adopt it. And that will be for the 23, 24 mm -hmm. school year. So parents can request other kinds of 
needs, family needs and sports, for example, when they need to be on. Um, I love that you captured in the valuations of things that have come back. We also had an amazing, if you didn't come, you missed a treat, wax museum. And this, I know, it was so beautiful. So we, and yes, it rained. <laughs> of course it rained in May on our poor little baby. So we have something called the Wax Museum where, where students are charged with the responsibility of selecting a per, a people who have made a difference. So they get to pick. There's, I think, 65 kids that participated. And it was people all the way from like William Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, Charles Darwin, Vincent Van Gogh, Martin Luther King, Neil Armstrong, Jane Goodall, Amelia Earhart. Lots of, there's quite a few sports, LeBron James. I didn't go see him. Steph Curry. Steph Curry, yeah. Steph Curry. Put that in a minute. Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but I still love those kids, so it's fine that they pick those people. But uh, they got to pick, they had to do research, they had to write a report, they had to do a visual that went along with it, and then they had to stand there as a wax figurine, and they had this little red button, and you had to walk up and push their red button that would come to life and then they would give you interesting facts about their person. So it was just the cutest thing. And so they're practicing their public speaking skills. And we have a lot of shy, these are second and third graders. It's incredibly impressive. We have very shy kids and they'd have strangers coming up, you know, and they did. So it was a really sweet treat. And if you missed it this year, you gotta come next year. We haven't had it for four years because of COVID, but everything's coming back. So that's amazing. Okay, dressed in oh, thank you. And they all dress in character. And just to prove that, sorry, I don't have it for, well, you can share this around. Um, Miss, Miss Cheryl here took a picture of every single, pass that around, every single child got, was dressed in character. It looked like Halloween, but it was May. It was another day of May. All right. Now, where's my little list? Can I give you my Okay. Wax Museum. Lots going on. Um, back to the serious stuff. We are a school doing state testing this week. Kids are thrilled this month. <laughs> Super fun cash testing. I will say this. In the olden days, we used to be star testing, and the school like shut down for a week. And it was, it was actually really stressful because it was intense. I kind of like that the cast window is over the month because the teachers have made it so that it just feels like they're taking a test, which lowers test anxiety, which means we get a more authentic read of how the child is doing and with their, their performance. And, and progress. And so it's, you know, their language arts, their, their reading, their writing, and their math. And fifth and seventh grade do history and science as well. So it's pretty intense with the kids. You can't tell on campus. They seem to be having a blast at recess still, so it's all good. Um, but that's happening this month, so we do want to be cognizant of that. And there's a lot going on end of year activities. I expect to see a lot of cowboy hats on campus tomorrow, because <laughs> tomorrow is, where is he? Mr. Hoxie Day. <laughs> I don't have the time, but I have the cowboy hat. Um, it's a tent barbecue, so there'll be a lot of little mini Mr. Hockey tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, we got to gather that. We got to gather. Okay. Um, the talent show. Also, something again. We had one last year, but it was outside, and so this is the second talent show that we brought back since COVID. But it was just amazing to see the kind of talent that our students have. So that's exciting. Friday, May twelfth. The last garden day, boo! And the garden is really, I we need to show a before and after picture. I went back to the, the other day and just picturing it kite and covered in mud and muck and debris everywhere and where it is now. It looks like our garden. It's like a miracle. It's a garden miracle. And um, Heroes Days, we haven't had Heroes Day in four years. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this is a beautiful day. This is when we, we as a school thank all of our heroes, our firemen, our policemen, our ambulance workers, our the parks people, all of the people that just do so much for the community and, our, and the town. And it's our, a great way for us to say thank you to the heroes. And the kids usually make them little cards. And Mr. Hoxie does a big old barbecue. <laughs> that's true for the Mr. Hoxie way. So that's really exciting. And the barbecue is for everybody. Town folk, you guys are welcome to come as well. It's open to the community. And field day is on May 31st and our annual graduation. I can't believe that our eighth grade babies are leaving us on June 2nd at 10 o'clock on our field. And lastly, lastly, staff appreciation is this week. There's gorgeous flowers everywhere that was delivered. We had breakfast, lunch, amazing food yesterday. 
And I think the goal is to have all this gain tons of weight and readiness for summer. Because then we all got three boxes of Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> a little girl comes up and she goes, three. And I go, oh, you mean one. Goes, no, three. And I was like, darn, okay. If I have two. Um, and uh, what else? We have Chipotle lunch tomorrow. You're not, you all are not invited. But we will be eating Chipotle lunch in the Sap Lounge and frozen yogurt and toppings on Froyo on Thursday. And it says, thank you for your hard work. And um, then we'll be treated to a special rainbow on Friday. So just, and that, so these flyers are all around the school. And the staff feels just incredibly spoiled So from our parents. So thank you to our parents. But sorry, that was a long report, but there's a lot going on. So that's it. That's my report. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. Back to the evaluation. You wear so many hats. We don't have a principal. We, you have a superintendent slash principal slash FEMA advisor slash everything. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. You can tell your heart's in it, and we, we appreciate that. Um, so, uh, Ms. Devisfar, did you want to oh. comment on the flood update? Okay. Yep. Okay. So I wanted to find out of the $3 million that has been um, borrowed so far, uh, the bond, money how much of that has gone towards blood um you know expenditures and do you expect all of that to be reimbursed and if you don't expect fema to reimburse any bond money spent um i'd like to know about pursuing sfpuc now that's separate than zone seven there's already going to be a discussion with zone seven so i'm not talking about that but i wanted to know because you had said that um you had that we're paying the architect to speak to SFPUC about permission to put portables. So during that discussion, did the um, architect also talk to them about the damage that in my view, it seems like they, they, they are responsible for that damage potentially. So did the uh, architect talk to them about that? Um, and if not, or even if so, if, if nothing's happened on that, who's talked and what's been said. But I think since the architect has that special relationship and he's being paid, could you ask him to set up a meeting with Zone 7 so that members of the community that are interested and have information can see them face to face, have them explain why they wouldn't be responsible for to do some of that reimbursement. So um, this is on the agenda, so I can address it. The, uh, architect, that's not his role, um, so that wouldn't make sense for him to do that. Have we said stuff? Have we brought it up with SFPC, Caltrans, and Zone Seven? Yes. So far, it it seems to be a lot of no, no. The land is actually it's Caltrans' responsibility. No, no, it's Zone Seven. There's no, and this has been a conversation for probably ten years, and there's no one that is willing to take. Um, the responsibility we've talked to back then it was supervisor Valle, i think in 2015 we talked to him about this we've talked to the other assembly members about this supervisor hobert just uh, that's who that's who if town folks want to talk to him that's the people who really need to be talked to because they can put pressure mm -hmm. on those agencies it's just disheartening it's disheartening that there's zero responsibility from this we don't own this we don't own the creek and the and Personally, it, the fact that the arches were all the sedi sediment and debris were so full up, there was no not enough room for the water to move. Then the water came over and flooded us. So it doesn't seem like it's hard to kind of understand that. That's just my humble right. opinion. But um, I I've tried. We've had Neil's tried. We've had people try, and um, so far, no, not successful. Right. So, but your earlier question. So far, we're re really still working on all the preliminary steps that need to happen before any action can happen. Right now we're waiting for SFPC to give us permission because we are having to encroach on their land. And we've had, we've already had a couple meetings with them and it looks positive. Now we're just kind of needing to get the final paperwork done and then move forward. So we haven't spent any bond money, but the, the bond money is available because it does cross over that replacing the flat back classrooms was part of the bond project. Interestingly enough, they were flooded. And so that's why we're putting in the FEMA request for FEMA to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just remembered you saying that he had the relationship with them and I thought maybe he could arrange a meeting 
with so interested parties. Thank, thank you for your time. We're good. good. Um, so You're we're gonna coming for the um, the over uh, the Sonoma advisory, aren't they? Zone seven. Zone seven is okay. I don't yeah, know. March twenty fourth. So one other quick comment. Um, I don't know if I made this clear before, but um, these uh, forms you turned in will just go in order with the agenda items. And it's because of time constraints, it'll just be one opportunity to speak per person per agenda item. So I don't, I haven't looked super carefully at them. I just put them in random order. So if you filled out in the past, we've had people say, gee, I want to stand up once for myself and once for this person, once for this person. We're going to okay. just limit it to who's here can speak once. So uh, moving along, 6C, six, six uh, Facilities Maintenance Report. Mr. Hoxie. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we uh, item B1, uh, uh, the flood update, it looks like uh, an item. Oh, there was a presentation that went along. With I that. just want to make sure we, do we need to do that one? It's. Oh, I think it was just backup information. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's from the architect. Thank it's you, Sean. Your You're welcome. Yeah, okay. This is information. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Mr. Um, other than the usual stuff going around, fixing a few things here and there, uh, my weed whacker broke. And we just got that old something. I got to take it back to Campbell because they're the only ones that work on battery operated types we have. So, working on that. Um, doing a lot of paperwork. Trying to get prices and everything with FEMA, as Molly said. There's a lot of paperwork for that. Um, we demoed the portable. Um, this is what it looks like now. I think you've got a couple pictures there. Um, we had it during the, our last breaks. We demoed them out, called them off. And um, hopefully this week we will be removing the mud. And that should be the last of removal as far as taking everything off site from the flood. But we've waited so long. Give a shout out to MGM Trucking because they did the soil samples, which we had to have before we could dump them up. MAG. Um, MAG. Oh, MAG. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm thinking of a casino probably. <laughs> 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 well, that'll be able, so. uh, anyway, they, they did the soil samples for us on the mud, and um, they were going to haul it to the mm. disposal. We'll get it disposed of. Debbie, that's a huge thing. Uh, Mr. Hawkins told me a couple weeks ago, and I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I mean, that's a worry about how we're going to do that. I just personally want to shovel it back or send it home. <laughs> no, <laughs> Mr. Hawkins wouldn't let me. He's not like, a bad idea. Send it home. <laughs> but anyway, but thank you. Yeah. Oh, but I didn't do it. Once <laughs> again, just a fleeting thought. On the soil samples, we did come back with a little, some high metal contents and stuff in, the, in this pile here. So we tested the garden just to make sure, and our garden came back clean. So that's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Hoxie. Appreciate that. Uh, 6D, technology report. I'd like to report to the board that we are currently, in, as um, Superintendent Barnes said, we are currently in testing season. So during the season, uh, the IT department is pretty much all hands on deck for um, testing and ensuring um, the students have the right testing environment and good internet connection. Um, if uh, you were here earlier, uh, this is actually a separate testing environment that we set up for students so that um, students who need uh, a different environment for testing uh, can have uh, the environment that they have. Um, but besides that, it's pretty much uh, supporting the teachers uh, taking in tickets. And um, the one thing before I hand it over to uh, Ms. Clark is that um, the Biden administration has uh, given CISA um, the ability to give grants to states for cybersecurity funding. And we are, um, I am part of a subcommittee that is part of the grander uh, California, and we are in the process of uh, dispersing that money and going to figure out how to share it with everybody else within the state. Uh, the first disbursement is supposed to be this November, but I will, um, as we are kicking off, I will report to the board um, status updates with um, coordination between all the agencies between um, within California, including K-12. So um, besides that, uh, we're working on updates working on pretty much uh, making sure everything's okay for and prepping for uh summer as well so um miss clark 
Thank you for my presentation. Yeah. Just real quick, um, Sean has been really doing a lot of research on the cybersecurity because that's critical. You've mm -hmm. probably read what's happened in other districts and other entities. And so uh, it's an area that we're really concerned about. So I appreciate all your hard work and that you're really wanting to make sure Snow Glen School is secure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, data and ed tech update. You can go to the next slide. Just um, we are still in the middle of our student data confirmation. That is our current enrollment. Um, you can see we have our confirmed. That is our returning student status, our pre-enrolled, which is new students. Um, we have the, this yellow, which is more of a concern area. It's about 72 parents who have not done their data confirmation. That's not unusual. Um, I, I know there might be some people in this room who might not have done it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it, that's not totally unusual around this time. Pretty much we have our, our regular scramblers in the month of May who end up getting it done. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, we do have our non-returning, which is, I believe, eight students. And then, of course, we have our 25 graduates. Um, and that comes out to, so far, um, the two about 262 total projection to date for 23-24. But a lot of changes happen over the summer. So uh, next slide. Uh, FEMA project work. I am pretty much the person who gathers all the digital information once um, Hoxie and Mrs. Barnes have done the legwork. Um, and then I deal with the FEMA portal, which is a bit of a beast, but um, hundreds of documents is not an exaggeration. So um, there's a lot of photos, a lot of um, things that need to be uploaded. So these are the current projects um, that are in process that need documentation. And then, of course, I put up there that our project damage claims deadline is this Friday. So that is really what I'm concentrating a lot of my week on this week. So uh, next slide, please. And then I just want to go over some upcoming updates. I'm really glad there's a lot of parents in the room because uh, just, I'm not going to go over all of these, but some of the highlighted ones. Um, our eighth grade Gmail sunset 30 day notice goes out this week. I talked with our eighth grade teacher, let her know today. Um, that is basically gives our eighth grade, our graduates an update that their account is going to be closed. So if they want to save any of their data, we provide them instructions on how to do that. Um, we also have, we send out Chromebook loss invoices, I believe in our total years of doing this, we've only ever had one and it was miraculously found. So <laughs> um, we've never really had to, co to collect on that. Um, we also do things like Aries Parent Portal Holds, which we've never, ever, ever had to do. But if there was some extravagant fee or damage of some sort, we can put, or if there was just some some lingering data missing that was critical for a student's enrollment, we can put access to the portal on hold. Um, we do hibernate um, our K through seventh grade Gmail accounts over the summer, and that's so IT can um, do some critical rollover work um, for as we prepare for the 23-24 school year. Uh, I also want to point out final report cards will be mailed home on June 14th. And I have already started the process of um, discussion with Aries of doing our SIS rollover for 22, uh, 23 for the 24 school year. And so that rollover date is June 21st. And that's when we will start to see our new database for the new school year. And that's really it for my report. Thank you for that report. You're I really appreciate the tech team and for the help with testing and keeping all this going. It really helps the parents in our community. And I loved asking my kids about the standardized testing. I said, you, they're saying it's all online. I said, so you don't have Scantrons? Like, what are Scantrons? <laughs> <laughs> Number two, pencil filling in the bubbles. And I hated my name because it had nine letters in the last name. And so it was fun to have a little discussion about the olden days. <laughs> so... <laughs> Technology report. Uh, let's see, 6E Community Club report. Yes. Um, this is one that stole my thunder. That's my But I'll we'll just go over a couple of the community club items. Uh, mentioned, Ms. Barton mentioned Earth Day, uh, headed by uh, Aaron Choi. Had about a dozen families who gathered at the school and threw stuff out the front yard, removing weeds, dead plants, bring back the cows vines over the um, Front uh, with the bushes as well, they were overgrown. 
They planted some beautiful flowering plants to attract butterflies and hummingbirds to the front of our school. And then the most physically demanding work was moving this massive mountain of mulch that was in our parking lot all the way to the, the uh, garden beds. So many, many trips with the wheelbarrows to help um, get the mulch on the uh, packers. And a thank you to Jordan Franco for donating the, the mulch to the out there. Um, uh, Mrs. Barnes mentioned this week is Staff Appreciation Week, and we love to spoil our amazing teachers and staff. And I'd like to thank Christian Abimachi for coordinating this week. Um, over the weekend, we had our room parents come in and stealthily put the door decorations up. So if you look around the school, there's uh, doors on, uh, papers on the doors, uh, decorated with rainbows and sunshine. And all the children got to add a special message on their um, rainbows and sunshine to tell their teachers and staff how much we appreciate them. We did start off with breakfast on Monday in the staff lounge. Tuesday, we had uh, fresh bouquets of flowers and Girl Scout cookies. Mm -hmm. Wednesday, the young lunch from Chipotle. Thursday, frozen yogurt mm -hmm. with lots of toppings. And the Friday highlight is a rainbow word cloud, which we have gathered words from our students of how what uh, how they would describe our staff and teachers. And the new parents will also provide a basket of goodies to each of our teachers and staff with their favorite treats and snacks. So but we want to just tell our staff that we love them, we appreciate them, and they're the best thing our school has. <laughs> I just, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I have to tell you, the conversation in the staff room is the teach, ever, the staff is overwhelmed. I mean, they just are like, I can't, I can't, I can't believe it. I mean, it's just, it's the generosity and the love and the warmth and all the work that goes into making this week have everybody feel so special is, it's overwhelming. I mean, that it's, I, I, don't, I can't even say anymore. Just thank you. Thank you, parents that are here. It's, yeah. Yay. Thursday, Community Club will go to the new executive board. I've been part of the executive board for the past 10, 11 years or so. And now it's time for me to pass on the torch. What? <laughs> <laughs> You're a lifer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seventh grader. I'll be around next year to help uh, mentor everybody through. But we have a um, great new executive board in the works. I can't say who they are. Yeah, because we haven't voted them in. <laughs> but they will continue all the fantastic programs that makes no one school for them forever. Thank you. Item 6F Alameda County School Board Association Report. Okay, that would be me, but there's nothing to report. Nothing to report. Yeah. All right. Good, we like those quick ones. <laughs> 6G, Measure J bond implementation update presented by Mr. Bill Savage. Thank you for coming. Um, and as Bill coming up here, I did want to um, have the opportunity to answer um, our board member, Linda. She had a question. Bill is hoping you can help me answer this one a little bit. Um, her question was on, is there an ed code or government code concerning procurement? And what are kind of those laws around that? And I know that you and I kind of talked, we did talk a little bit, and you did share that there is government code 4525, where's my glasses? Um, and that re it does require that local agencies select professional services of architects, engineers, land surveyors, et cetera, on the basis of demonstrated competence and professional qualifications. This then ensures that services are engaged at a fair and reasonable price to the agency and the school district. And I think when Chad was here last time or the time before, one of the um, conversations we talked about is that, yeah, we did have a, a, a hierarchy or a priority list of some of these projects, but the flood threw us all for a loop-de-doop. So these back portables, we knew that they were on end of life um, but our real priority was the main building. But then the flood, those end of life, they, they died. They weren't just at the end of life. They're, they're Mr. Hoxie mowed them over. They're gone. And so we buried them. And uh, so the whole conversation was the need for urgency for streamlining. Um, because right now, our programs are struggling. Our teachers are not in 
their places. So right here, our library cannot have, be a library. Mm -hmm. Our art teacher cannot be an art teacher. Our Eagle's Nest is in the auditorium, which then means, which is not set up for the, their program. And they also take that over when we then have rainy days, so there's no place for the kids for recess or rainy day PE or anything like that. So it's a really hard situation. So our number one priority is we need to streamline this. We need to get those temporary portables in and we need to get going. And so, uh, but I don't know if you want to speak any more on that. So part of the question, question was, sure. um, and I don't know, I mean, Ryan gave me some information that I did not have before I wrote you that request. Um, can you demonstrate that we have complied with the competition rules? I know that we're compliant with the, um, well, there's California code as well as federal acquisition rules. So well, We wouldn't be subject to federal acquisition rules okay. for these. Uh, consulting services that were that are on the board's agenda for tonight. Okay. So we have complied with the government code in that we've uh, basically uh, gone out to qualified firms and individuals and then requested proposals from them and we've compared the proposals. In the case of the surveying, I think I've provided the backup the documents for that. And then in the case of the structural evaluation for the main building, which is the other item that's on the agenda, uh, we only received, we went out, we did an RFP by email to three firms, two responded, one finally responded with a proposal, and one said they were too busy and couldn't deal with it, the other did not respond. And so we did do a competitive selection, if you will, and the, the price that we received for that is actually very reasonable for the structural evaluation. So there's two parts to that, correct? They mm -hmm. want to look to see if we have any kind of site needs. I mean, we think that maybe that has been completed back in 1992 or what have you, but we would need that and then any additional shoring up for the roof. Yeah, it's, I mean, for, before we embark on the work on the main building, and just as an example, take the roof that leaks, sure. right? We know that that's a high priority. But in my experience as an architect, and also having worked on a number of buildings just like this one, you are very commonly going to find that the seismic deficiency for a building like that involves a roof diaphragm and the connections of the diaphragm to the wall and the uh, joists and the ceiling planes, all of those connections. And so you can't, it's not efficient to do the roof repair without dealing with the structure that's under the roof and that's connected to it. And so this it's a you know it's a catch twenty two for us, and if we want to prioritize the main building and getting it going, the critical path runs right through doing a structural evaluation, and that will get us moving as fast as possible. Okay. And did you have anybody actually look to see what what well, we needed? In that's the what we're the, the service that's being proposed on the on the board's agenda tonight. It's for ZFA structural engineers to come out and do a tier one tier two analysis which is a, it's basically a, a checklist inspection and they identify deficiencies. They, they have the drawings from the retrofit in the 30s. And so um, then the, uh, they have those drawings, they use the drawings, they'll do a site inspection, they'll do the checklist that's used by the Division of State Architect and it's part of, I believe it's the American Society of Civil Engineers um, checklist. And so once they identify deficiencies, then they're going to prepare a preliminary, you, you'll see the proposal have two parts. One part was to prepare uh, drawings, to how to uh, do the structural upgrade to deal with those deficiencies. So there was seismic work done in the 90s, and they can't find the paperwork for that. Mm -hmm. But according to Diane Everett, who was the superintendent principal that was here before, a man named Frank Linhart was the structural engineer. Unfortunately, he's died. Mm -hmm. And we have not been able to, um, the <clears throat> paperwork has gone missing, and I've tried to reach DSA, and apparently they say it would be in a, a warehouse up a in warehouse Sacramento. warehouse in Sacramento, yeah, that's, that's but, what they all say. It's true. She says that the, um, that work was completed, and um, so talking around, trying to drill this down, um, it would have happened between 1992 and 96. And so we're of the mind that most 
of the work that would be needed now has probably been completed. Okay, so that's good information. And so let me follow up. I still think it would be very appropriate to have a structural engineer do the evaluation of the building yeah. that the board is on. It's on your agenda for tonight. And okay. so, but I appreciate the information and we can follow up with the essay for the future. Yeah, well, I've gone as far as I can go. I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's actually a path. It's like FEMA. There's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a way to get there. You just got to get there. More power to you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, presentation. Okay. Um, we're, I'm going to take you through a brief presentation, board members and uh, Superintendent Barnes, members of the community. I'm Bill Savage. I'm a facilities consultant helping with the implementation of uh, Measure J Bond. Uh, next slide, please. And I just I want to give you an overview of where we are now. And I, I hate to say it because it's a Tuesday night, but I want to talk about budgets and show, you know, it's kind of dry, but I want to uh, mm -hmm. show the board how we set up the budgets for the program and what some of the key topics are related to the budgets and talk a minute about our cash flow constraints because we do have some. I want to talk about how we can define our critical projects. And we just talked a little bit about one way we can do that and look at a schedule. So what? how long does it take to get to construction? How long does it take to get through construction? And then I want to talk a little bit about where we are with the pre-design services and design services, and then give an update that I worked with uh, Mr. Hamilton, the architect, on for the temporary portables. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so one of the first things I've got, and I'm going to try and do this for every uh, presentation, is an acronym guide. Okay, and it's on the right side. And so you're going to need these because we are every, as you know, every industry has their acronyms. And these are important for everyone because we all, they'll come up as we talk about things. I'm not going to go through them right now. But uh, so in, in the context of where we are with the bond program, we are in the pre-design phase. We are not designing anything other than the temporary buildings out in the front. Uh, for the flood uh, replacement. So we're using the original facility needs summary that we, that was used as part of the bond that totals $10.9 million that has a project list on it. And we're going to show you how we set up a program budget and individual project budgets, and then a cash flow for the bond program. And how do we look at a schedule? And we're going to talk a little bit about the cash flow and the bond sales, there's three issuances that are scheduled and the timing of the issuances, it means you can't do all the work at once necessarily, depending upon how much all the work is, right? Because you're going to get 10.9 million over the course of six or eight years and it affects our ability to structure the project in, a, in an efficient manner. So we'll talk about that. And I want to talk about project timelines for school projects and then uh, talk about a little bit what we were just talking about, pre-designed tasks for our projects and then confirm where we are with our priority projects and our need to get an architect. And okay, I'll keep moving. I know everybody wants to get to the public comments. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so this is the format that we use for our program budget and it includes revenue to the program in the blue on the top and you can see the 10.9 million and there's other lines for revenue. One item of revenue that we will receive over time, your bond funds, have, the bonds have been sold, the funds are on deposit at the county. You will earn interest on those bond funds. I made an estimate. Uh, I worked in a, another district, a small district in Contra Costa County to put $20 million on deposit for six years and earned uh, $2 million in interest on those funds while they were in, in flux mm -hmm. going through that. So I've put in a placeholder of $310,000 in there just as a placeholder. You can see each of the projects is listed. Their original budget is listed. And then if we make changes that the board approves in the center column, we put the change and it will then change the adopted budget on the right hand side. This is a program budget. It's a roll up of all the projects. All the project numbers feed into this budget. So there's a couple of projects, there's four items at the bottom that are not on the project list that we may want to think about how we fund. And one of them is district furniture and equipment. A second, district-wide technology. A third 
is program management. And I'll show you a program management budget. There are costs related to managing the program. And I will show you some of those. And finally, there I've left a line item here as we do for every district. Do we want to carry a reserve, a risk pool, if you will? Because in construction, things happen. So we, we can talk about that as we go forward. So this is the program budget, and this is the format that I'll keep the board updated and the community updated as we go forward. Next slide, please. So this is the project budget worksheet. So every project has a revenue source at the top, right? And this is the this is the main building general upgrades, $1.9 million approximately in revenue. And so what we do is based upon our experience doing many, many projects for schools with DSA is we look at the direct construction amounts, I, what we call hard costs, okay? So what does it cost to actually build the job? And then we look at what are the project costs related to this project. And those are what we call soft costs. And don't it's not meant to be uh, pejorative in any way. They are all required. And many of them are you need to budget for. Very clear. Architectural engineering, fees for the agencies. Remember your acronyms? DSA, CGS, CDE. Okay. That's anyway, those are those are our agency costs. We have costs to do that. Construction inspection. So we DSA requires a full-time uh, inspector, it used to be called the inspector of record, it's now called the project inspector. Testing labs, utility fees, construction management, commissioning, moving, and then is there furniture and equipment in this project budget? The one of the most important things that we put in every budget are contingencies. We set aside amounts that we don't budget for the work, but that we have available when things happen. And so we have, for example, a construction contingency in this budget. And you, I, I know this is too hard to read. It's mostly about kind of the format and the approach. Um, we have, and that's for what we know in this world as change orders, things that happen during construction. So for renovations, modernization of buildings, we typically set aside 10% of the direct construction cost. For a new building, we might take it down to 5% because it's, you know, it's not as many unknowns. We set aside an escalation contingency. We look at when will the project be built, and we know that the cost of construction goes up every year by some astronomical amount right now, but we use averages, in this case, we use an average of 5.5% to 7% per year. So when we look at our schedule, where does the project occur? We look at the number of years, we multiply that times the uh, contingency amount, the percentage, and then we add that amount into the, to the project budget. So just to give you an idea, out of the 1.9 million for the main building general upgrades, 1.5 million is available for direct construction. All of the, it's for construction, for change orders, and for escalation. And so then we have a real idea of what, so when we go out to bid or we sign a guaranteed maximum price agreement with a contractor, we need to know what's our exact construction budget because we can't award a budget, a contract for more than we have in our budget. And so that's, this is probably one of the most important pieces of our work. So one, I got two more and then I'll get off the budget. So, okay, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. So program management, uh, it does cost the district money to manage the overall program. And so the types of costs that are incurred by the district that you can't necessarily assign to any project per se, we call program management costs. Many school districts have staff members that they pay when they're and they're allowed to pay them if they're directly involved in managing the bond. That may not be the case in this district. And, and I haven't put anything in any of that line item yet. But there are operating costs. There might be office expenses. There will be legal costs. There will be financial costs. There will be auditing costs. And then we need to confirm where our bond issuance costs are being paid, whether those are being taken out of the bond proceeds, whether they're net or not. And uh, Ms. Barnes and I have been working on that 
with our financial advisor. So that's our program management budget. Next slide, please. So this is probably the most important slide. And the concept of cash flow is you receive your funds, and the top uh, bar, the wide bar at the top, shows the years in which your funds are received. And so you can see here's the bond sale of $3 million in 2023. And other revenue to the program, we may have state revenue, there could be FEMA revenue, I just heard that discussion, so we don't know. All of this down here is the expenditures per year by project. Oops, go back one more. Sorry, so my, when I touched the screen. There. And when you get to the bottom, you add up all your expenditures and you have an ending balance. Your ending balance can never be zero or below. Well, I guess it could technically be zero, but it can't be negative. And so what this means is that you have to structure either your, 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 both your revenue and your expenditures in order to ensure that your ending balance is never below zero. Notice this right here, because the issue for us is the bond issuance schedule shows 2023, 2025, and 2028 with the largest bond sale. And so it impacts our ability to do all of the work we may need to do at once, because you can see in order to make, to avoid getting to zero here, we have to push the expenditures for some of the projects out to 2027 and 2028. And so this is a really an exercise right now in figuring out how do we not want to do this? This is an exercise in what are the constraints we face? How can we push on the revenue and bring it forward? And how can we look at the expenditures and how we package the program projects to ensure that we have uh, a cash flow that's positive at all times? Okay, so that's one of the challenges that we actually are we're facing right now. And uh, Ms. Barnes and I are working on that too. Next slide, please. So prioritizing our projects. Um, this is the list that I have that went with the bond measure, the master plan list, the facilities need summary. When you really, when you boil it down, and I think everybody knows it, 80% of those expenditures are on the main building. And really that is the priority project for the district. Other projects are important too, there's no doubt about it, but 80% of this identified facilities need is in the main building. And so how do we, how do we structure the work in the main building in the most efficient way possible and make it the most attractive possible to a contractor so that they want to bid and they can perform the work efficiently and we get the lowest possible price. That's really the task for us. And so a couple of thoughts, no, no conclusions yet. We're going to need to move out of the main building for a little while, potentially, just to have this happen in the most efficient way. And so, you know, I'm just I'm getting this barn ready for this already. We, we talked. We already talked about I know we did it, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's going to be, it'll be a big thing. So how do we do that? Well, one of the best ways we can do it is have the portables in back hooked up and ready to go and the portables up in front, because then there's five spaces that main building operations could move into, things like that. So we're, this is all in flux and we're working on how to make this happen. But that's what I see as come really the issue with all of our project priorities and how to how to handle getting the main building, making it available for spending 80% of our bond funds and doing it in a very efficient uh, way, cost effective way. Next slide, please. So in school construction in California, if you tell us to go right now with the architect, it takes a year before you can start construction, approximately. Okay, now it depends on a whole lot of things. It depends on the size of the job, the package, a whole lot of things. But you can see the, the phases of design are up here, schematic, design, development, construction, drawing, agency approvals. The Division of State Architect will take four months minimum to approve a package like the main building, maybe even more. Uh, bidding and award, construction, occupancy, and closing. So um, that's just, just a reality of where we are. Construction will take uh, its own time frame. So one uh, item, and somehow my text ran off the page, I apologize for that. So if one, here's a first pass at the main building. 18 to 24 months, probably 18, 
And by 18, what I mean is a good way to structure that is summer number one, school year, and summer number two. And that gets us to a really decent time that that could work could all happen, seismic upgrade, all the roof repairs, all the electrical upgrades that are there. So, you know, can we beat that? Maybe. But that's a nice, it's a nice structure because you get a, a summer at the beginning and a summer at the end. It gives you a really a great way to, to bracket that for you. So that's, we'll work on the estimated schedule of that, the schedule as we get there. Next slide, please. I think I'm almost done. Um, so for the main building project, the key pre-designed services is on, as we discussed, is on your agenda for tonight structural evaluation. We're also preparing a to go out with a request for qualifications and proposals for a, a, an architect in order to ensure that we've complied with the competitive selection requirements using <coughs> the new bond fund, okay? And so we will be bringing that back to the board at a future meeting. And the other projects uh, in construction is the rear portables, and that's or it's not in construction, it's in, it's in pre-design. So the issues that we face with putting the portables in the back are that it's within the flood zone. And so uh, we need to get with the Division of the State Architect right up front because they, uh, I, I have experience with another district that had a flood issue on their site and they have pretty stringent requirements related to flood zone construction, as you can imagine. Um, and we may have to do some other studies like a hydrological study. And so we want to get in front of them. So Chad is setting up a meeting with a structural engineer to meet with DSA to review what are they going to require from us to get these going. So if we're focusing right up front on the back three, the front two, that creates our space to move out of the main building, and we keep that one going by getting the architect. So that's sort of the overall plan, trying to uh, get, get everything going. Next slide, please. So right now, this project at the front is in design with the architect, Hamilton and Aiken Architects. One of the key pieces we need is an, a current and updated boundary and topographic survey with utility locating on it, and that's the contract that's on the board's agenda for tonight. Um, the uh, CPUC uh, approval process is underway. Mm -hmm. And tonight on the board's agenda, we have an uh, item for compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. And this is a notice of exemption for the project. And for a number of reasons that you see on the NOE, the notice of exemption, uh, the project is exempt because it's temporary in nature, it's a minor disturbance of land, it's minimal utilities, and it's a minimal addition of space to an existing space. So uh, that, I believe, is my, my report. Next slide. And we're sailing. For the two companies that we're ratifying tonight, we've gone through this process where yes. we've gotten various quotes. Okay, yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, uh, Bill. Appreciate your right. hard work and presentation to support. Uh, any comments from the board members on that? Uh, we do have a couple of, uh, let's see, three public comments on this item. Uh, we'll go ahead and set the timer for three minutes. We're going to start with Ms. Margie Porter first. This is Oversight Committee having to do with Measure J Bond 6G. And then next we'll have Irene Martin and Debbie Ferrari. Um, I'd like to talk about the Oversight Committee. And I wanted to let you know that my husband and I have lived in Samoa for almost 43 years. And our two daughters and our only grandchild attended Samoa in school. When our daughters were in school, we were very active in the community. And as I'm sure many of you have children right now currently attending. Um, I want to talk, before I can talk about that measure, the oversight committee, I'd like to mention a little bit about the bond measure. Hmm. I recall a bond measure that was passed while Diane Everett, or possibly the previous school superintendent, was totally different from Measure J. Measure J, the majority, well, back then, the majority of the students that attended Sonoma Glen School were Sonolians. Parents were involved heavily in the decision-making project process. Fast forward to 2022. 
The bomb measure was quickly introduced to the community, given the community very little time to, to make an informed decision. And this is very disturbing to me as a Somalian. Those who opposed were publicly humiliated, signs were taken down, and bully tactics took over. Um, the piece, a lot of the people were considered enemy of the Somal, um, considered minority, no dissension was allowed or tolerated. That's disturbing to me. My husband and I were not here when Measure J was voted on that day, particularly because we were on vacation. We heard at first that Measure J did not pass. Then we heard the county gave Somal 30 days to recount the votes. Not only does this create mistrust, anxiety, but the question is now accountability. I'm asking the board to appoint additional members on the oversight committee to not just represent the school, but the people of Sonoma who are concerned about how the funds are allocated, particularly since we're paying for this bill, for this measure, Jay. I understand correctly there are, I think, seven members in the oversight committee, um, and I'd like to see a more rounded group of people who can, I guess it's transparency what I'm looking for. I, I want to know that the money that we are spending on this bond is going to, how it's implemented, what's involved, um, and, to, and to inform the community, to let them know that the money that they're spending on this bond measure is being used wisely. Because I know now that most of the students that attend Samoa Board School are not from Samoa. So there's very, there's very few that are attending school, and there's a lot of us that are paying for this school. We'd like to know if the transparency counts. Okay, and um, another thing I'd also like to mention. Thanks, Ms. Corey. That's uh, the three minutes. Oh, okay. So we'll go ahead to the uh, next commenter. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Irene Martin. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I, I'm, uh, if it's okay, I'd like to uh, stay here. Is that all right? Yeah. You have to be in the camera. camera. Okay. They're uh, streaming it. Sorry. I'm Irene Martin. I've lived in Sonoma for 47 years. I'm a retired educator, 52 years of service, 34 as an administrator for Haber Unified School District. I've taught at uh, elementary level all the way through adult school. I've been a high school uh, guidance counselor, high school principal. I've been uh, the elected president of the Association for California School Administrators at Hayward Chapter. And I've read for the Educational Testing Service, uh, which uh, tests teacher uh, credential candidates in English and language arts. Mm -hmm. You can't pass that, you can't be a teacher. I wrote a letter uh, to the board um, and I'm here to emphasize the fact that Linda Hurley speaks for us. We stand with her and we support her. And I'd like to read the letter that I sent to the board members. Uh, I have a copy for you too, Mrs. Barnes, back at my seat called Make Sure You Get a Copy. Thank you. The purpose of this letter is to bring to your attention issues regarding the passage of Measure J and the appointing of the Oversight Committee, which will monitor the spending of the money. In the days following the November election, we learned from reliable news sources that Measure J had not passed. About a week later, we subsequently were informed that Measure J had been passed. This sudden, surprising reversal caused confusion raised doubts and cast a shadow on the election outcome for a number of voters. With this turn of events, division among Sonoma voters became more pronounced. Our divided community became even more divided. The breach is very real and should not be ignored. 
as was pointed out before the election by concerned, caring Sinoleans, a bond issue in hard economic times is controversial and unsettling. Many households are struggling with inflationary hardship. Some voters on fixed incomes are hard pressed to make ends meet. Homeowners insurance premiums are skyrocketing because of the threat of wildfire. The 300 households that must pay this bond levy are proud of our school, but must also deal with hard economic realities. In order to deal with our dilemma in a responsible and conciliatory way. Uh, the time's almost up. In order to restore trust and faith, we need participation that is transparent. Thank Increasing you. the number of the oversight committee members the, the to 11 is, or 13. The time is up. Sorry. Thank you very much. And thank you for spending this time. Uh, Ms. Debbie Ferrari. I'd like to thank the, the first two people that spoke and um, say that I agree with what they had to say. Um, also, once again, I'm just going to say that I'm concerned about the amount of interest that's going towards the bond. It's 33 million, whatever it is, but the school's only getting 10.9. So that's a big concern to me. I'd like to find out you said hopefully the money's earning interest right now. How much interest is the money in the bank that we borrowed earning? What bank is it in? I know there's CDs right now that are running um, about 4% for a short-term CD. So I hope that money is earning good interest right now while we're accruing all that interest. And then I'd also like to ask if you could put it on the agenda that each member of the oversight committee could speak, not on today's agenda, obviously, in the future, that each member of the oversight committee could speak as to their perspective and their goals and their plans um, so that we could perhaps get a better comfort level with the oversight committee. And I know there are some members of the oversight committee that were also bashing Linda Hurley, and I feel that's um, there's a conflict there, and you've got the, you know, all the poor will that, that we talked about. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, that's uh, 6G. Uh, we'll now move on to community comments from the community. So these are any items you want to talk about, but it will still be limited to 20 minutes. Thank you, Sean, for keeping track of that, and three minutes per speaker. Uh, the first we will invite up is Mr. David Sellinger. I hope you're ready. No. And Mr. Rod Zeiss, get, re get ready here second. And Denise Romo. All right. You're on Thank deck. You. So uh, my my first comment that I submitted is in the in the open section uh, around school bylaws. Uh, Mr. Jurgensen, you'd asked about reviewing some of the school bylaws last uh, board meeting. And one of the things that I noticed was as I compared different school districts' uh, agenda and agenda management policies, I saw that uh, some school districts publish the uh, the origin of parental letters. They allow parents to send letters in to speak then on behalf of that letter, and it's uh, just very transparent. I don't think there's any I use the word transparent. I want to be really clear that's not an an, uh, an accusation by any stretch of the ima imagination. It's just an, an observation. Um, uh, obviously, uh, 8B came up, and that was, a. I think, it set, sent this uh, community, especially parents and teachers, into a bit of uh, an uproar. And knowing where that came from, I think, is very important, and we, we didn't know. Um, I'd also like to have my co-speaker come up here, Anna Wong, with her daughter here. Um, she had asked to make some comments as well, so if that's okay, if I can use the rest of my time with her as a co-speaker, is that? This is a new thing to me, but... If that's okay. I would welcome you to uh, to join me and, and make your comments. Thank you. I actually, I'm Talia Trong. I'm actually an eighth grader here at Snow Glen School. I am also a resident of Snow, and I originally came here today to speak on the matter of the one of the agendas, which was 8B, I believe. And that is off the agenda now, so I'm talking to you. And what I wanted to talk about was, as a student, I feel that this matter is... Well, it feels like an invasion of privacy 
because as a student, I feel that for many people, it's when you learn that, you know, Snow by itself, I've been here for six years and I love this school. I love the community of trust and respect it has. And it's always seemed like a safe space to learn and grow and become our best self. But this new measure I feel is, it's incredibly terrifying because it feels like it breaks this community of trust that we have here. Because if teachers may be reporting on students maybe being transgender, it's a breach of privacy. Students, they deserve to have their own privacy respected. I feel that they deserve to choose, hey, do I want to tell my parents this? Maybe later, maybe, but it's their choice. And I feel that I know as parents, a lot of people here, you want to help your children. You want to protect them and guide them as they grow forward to become their best selves. But I feel this measure is not the way to do it. Students deserve to be given the choice to choose to tell their parents, not be forced to do so by said teachers. And I suppose that is the main reason I'm talking here, because I feel that more people need to understand that as a student, this impacts us too, and we need a chance to speak. Thank you. Big special thank you to people who are sharing their thoughts and especially to the students. You are heard. We do hear you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zeiss. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Great. Good. Um, so I'm in company meetings quite regularly, and I pretty well kept my mouth shut. I'll say a few things if we're here and we're there. But I got to saw a sign. This is a great sign. Anyone disagree yeah. with us? Anybody? Okay, this is why we're here for the kids. You may have a different opinion than I do. You have a different opinion than someone else. We all have different opinions. But we're here for what? The kids. There are people here to talk. And I'm going to ask you, keep an open mind. Don't be manipulated or by other people's thoughts. Keep an open mind. Think, do your homework. You're going to hear people. I can talk, create hate here. I can create here, left or right. It doesn't matter. Think for yourself what's going on. So as I've been coming here for a while, and I haven't said a lot of things, I can point some things out. Prop J did divide this town. I'm telling you straight up. There was stuff done. I'm not saying left or right. I'm just saying there was stuff done. So, signs stolen, people harassed. Okay. People are afraid to even say what they learned to vote on. Okay. It divided this town. It divided it. And then, unfortunately, which was a good thing, we had a flood. And what happened? We did this as a community again. Mm -hmm. We came here to school. We had people. Ben Copeland invited people to come in his house. I had people sit in my house. I went up and helped them clean up and do work in their houses. We did this again. But now what I'm seeing is someone coming, people coming here and try to create division. We don't need division. We need to do this. Okay. I can come out and I can say things and point other points that people said this or that. I don't want to do that. Um, I was against Measure J. But I've also said in the past that I'm willing to pay more taxes for the school for small classrooms. So am I an anti-taxer? Or am I a person saying, look, I think of the kids. I want the kids to do well in school. So before you come up here, if you're going to talk about negativity, Think, please. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I have something to present to Molly, but I'd like to do it at the next meeting, and I'd love to defer my time to Rihanna. Uh, we're just going to go in order of people on this list. So you want to defer that to the next I, I meeting? I will, yeah. I'm going to wait till next time. Okay. But, well, it was good news, and we like good news here. So, so all right. for the next time. All right. <laughs> Everybody who's here, come next meeting, please. Okay. okay. Uh, next, we have, I'm sorry if I'm reading this incorrectly, Laura. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I came here to talk about um, item 8B that was on the agenda. Since it was removed, uh, basically I'd like to see it not ever come back on the agenda, um, especially in regards to AB 13 or 1314. Um, that's of particular interest to me. It requires schools to notify parents within three days of, in writing if a child identifies as anything other than the gender assigned to them at birth. Um, first off, on a purely practical level, I don't think it's a good idea for a school to have this policy. There is a Gender Non-Discrimination Act. If the school has something in the kid's personnel file that they are of a different identified differently, that does open up the school to liability. Um, if anything were to ever happen to that kid, the school send, has something in writing that that child was not identified um, as strictly heterosexual. My other concern is more ideological. Um, AB 1314 operates in the name of parental rights, but it's more of a an attempt at parental control. It doesn't have anything to do with the emotional needs of the students themselves or any support that they might need. Schools are not about the parent, as Rodney Zai said, it's about the student. It's about what the student needs, if they need a safe space to explore what they might be. They need someone safe that they can talk to. They need to have that trust that they can talk to someone confidentially. Schools are there for the benefit and the support of the children, not the parents. AB 13, 14 is an attempt to legislate in a relationship and support between a child and a parent that might not be there. And it does so without regards to the needs of the child or their personal situation at home. And I would suggest that rather than push a school to betray the confidence and trust of a child, that we all go home and work on building that sort of relationship with our children so that they have the confidence and security to talk to us directly, so that we don't need to have a school act as a tattletale. And if that's not always possible, because we are imperfect parents and our children are imperfect, I think we should feel grateful that a school would have the trust of a child so that they have somewhere to go to talk to someone that they need to. So, thank you. Thank you. Farhana Muhammad. Since I already said my name, hi everyone, I'm Farhana Muhammad. I am here to advocate for the rights not only of my two children that go to Sanol, but also of all the children attending Sanol. As everyone here knows, in order to sort of be successful in anything, an individual needs to feel included prioritized and have the freedom to follow their own plan. This right also applies to all of your children and mine. I personally come from a very conservative Muslim background. If you guys know conservative, you know Muslim people are conservative. <laughs> my family moved to the United States from the Middle East to ensure my sister and I had access to education, freedom to practice our religion any way we wanted, and most importantly, the ability to express ourselves without the fear of persecution. That being said, I'm extremely concerned about what has been happening recently at our school. At the last school board meeting, a community member commented on the number of new faces. Although if you realize, these faces are not new to Sanol, nor to the school. It seems that the school board and the community have lost sight in what Sanol really looks like today. In the past, we saw our community being inclusive and the school board supporting all children, regardless of how they look or what they believe or where they're from. And they focus on providing a nurturing environment and excellent education. 
However, recent events have made me question the board's unity and the commitment to the well-being of every child here. As a community member, I choose to remain engaged until we bring inclusion and psychological safety back to our school. I'm here to remind you all that Sanol is the home for many children, all from different races, ethnicities, genders, you name it, all of us are different. Our school motto around kindness is a testament to this principle. We should always be kind to others, especially when you don't know their journey and you don't know where they are. True inclusion goes beyond diversity. It's about creating a sense of belonging. Everywhere, where everyone feels value or respected and included, we will then thrive as a community. So let us prioritize the well-being and inclusion of every child in our school, every family, no matter where they're from, how they look, or what they believe. Let us stop taking sides and being divisive, and that does not benefit any of our children, nor does it benefit this community. We can have different beliefs, and that's what makes us all so wonderful. But we cannot allow our individual beliefs to hinder our ability to create an environment where our children can flourish and feel safe. Let's be better together. So no one for all. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm a former trustee at this school. I'm speaking on behalf of my husband, Maurice, too. He's at the back. <laughs> he was also a trustee at Escondido Unified School District in Southern California. Why am I here? Because of recent events, I feel that the current board or maybe lacking in the right educational foundational basics of what it is to be a board member, what your legal requirements are as a board member, and how you are required to act in public as a board member. The last board, which was comprised of Denise, Liz, and Mike Picard, took it upon themselves to get masters in governance from CSBA. The board prior to that, which consisted of myself and Neil, <coughs> And Denise, too, <laughs> also took it upon ourselves to consistently and repeatedly learn about the laws in the state of California that governed our conduct, to learn about the California Department of Education, and to also learn about the federal laws that guided things like Title IX and civil rights. Without that knowledge, you put yourselves at risk, and you put our community at legal risk. <clears throat> I think after the way 8B has been handled, I would very much like to say as a community member that there should be a resolution on the next agenda that the three of you take mandatory training from CSBA in all aspects of governance, your roles and your responsibilities. I would also include in that diversity, equity and inclusiveness training. As the last guest spoke, Many of you have commented about new people in Sonal. These people are not new. These people have been living here for years. They're just not white like you. We are different. And so with that, I'd just like to say thank you. Talia Chong. She did? Okay. Thank you. Amber McKnight. Hello, my name is Amber McKnight. This is my daughter, Alice. Before I started to speak, she wanted to say a few words. I'll go first. <laughs> All right. Um, as I'm sure... We all know many people are going to talk about the moral, ethical origins of item HB, and I'm fairly certain no one's really going to change their minds tonight if they feel very strongly one way or the other. However, the thing that I would like to address, and the thing that I know Alice cares about the most, is not just our school culture of kindness, but also our school culture of making sure we are addressing appropriate issues. 
seeing this on the agenda, knowing that it never even left a committee vote at the state level is very confusing because it makes it hard to understand why it was motivated to be on there in the first place. When you think about things as a parent, when we're discussing items that we want to see at the end of the school year, seeing this instead of, are we going to reopen campus so K-1s can continue the tradition of singing at the start of the school year? Because I can speak for myself, having Alice and TK at the start of the year and having the pandemic hit, those relationships that we were able to build and cultivate by having an open campus and open inclusive community are what carried us through the pandemic. It's what carries me even now being involved in the school, being involved with Girl Scouts. Two families joined this school year just from how much I talk about it. Two more are joining next year, including one in preschool. There are another two that are waiting for their children to be old enough to apply because of how much I talk about this school and this community. On a personal note, I had a cancer scare for my son recently. It was terrifying. We had to go to Stanford, oncology, being able to reach out to Cheryl, to Cindy in the office, to Miss J, to her teacher, Miss Garcia, and let them know so they could support Alice through this. I can't imagine doing that in a different school, in a different community. Having this sort of item on our agenda has no place here because this is not something that was ever going to be a viable topic for our school when it's not even in the committee. Oh, she wants to talk now. What would you like to say? We have 20 seconds. If Sanul Glenn supports equality and shows everyone that we're supposed to have equality, if the students learn to spread equal kindness to everyone, if they're going to vote against transgender, I vote no. I'll start by saying thank you for taking me the, uh, the agenda. It's been an emotional three days for parents and me personally as a human being. So I'm going to read my statement. I tried to change it. I hope it makes sense. My name is Rihanna, and I am a parent at Snow Glen School. I am a 40-year-old, not fully out bisexual human. I have only come out to a few friends. I choose to not tell my family, as I am not comfortable in doing so for personal reasons. Now here I am, fearfully and nervously coming out to a room of strangers. And why do I tell you this? I tell you this as a perfect example to why this insensitive topic, like the one removed today, is not in the best interest of our transgender and non-binary youth. It is such a terrifying and personal choice to come out to someone. Every time, might I add, it's not just once. And for some, it is the only sense of control we in the LGB community have. I ask you, why did you feel this was necessary to put on our beautiful school's agenda? Why was it so important? Our school's motto is kindness. I am disturbed and disappointed to have seen this on the agenda. This is a predatory, unsafe policy that should have not been brought up ever at this school. I urge you to educate yourself on transgender and non-binary statistics if you are truly trying to help our children. 40% of transgender people attempt suicide. Over 80% of transgender people consider suicide. The best way to help our transgender and non-binary youth is to love and accept them for their true selves 
and not to break their trust and out them, potentially causing an unsafe home environment. So I ask you again, why was it so important to add this discussion to our kind accepting schools agenda? Thank you for your time. see. Not on the agenda. We have uh, Miss Margie Quarry. Did you want to make any comments during this period? Um, what am I supposed to talk about? This, uh, you put it down before, <clears throat> not on the agenda item. But maybe this is just a duplicate of the other one? I think it's a duplicate. Okay. Uh, for the remaining one minute, the last one is Miss Lisa Disbrow. Is it, is it highlighted what she wanted to say? It says not on the agenda, but then it also says oversight committee increasing size. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Lisa Disbro. I'm a retired teacher. And uh, I just wanted to show you this. Oh, I wanted to start with this. Every life is precious. Can you state where you're from? Please? Yeah, I'm from Moraga. I'm a retired Contra Costa teacher of 40 years. You don't vote here. I don't vote here, but you I'm a citizen here. And let's, stop, stop. 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 We need order. Please respect. Please Thank continue. you. Just like you are entitled to go to any school board in the state of California, so am I. I'm exercising my freedom. Mm -hmm. I want to remind you that the Supreme Court of the United <clears throat> States and the California Supreme Court recognize <coughs> that every child is entitled to a quality education. My mentor is Jaime Escalante. I'm a bilingual teacher. And he said that every child needs a quality teacher and a quality education. And I believe that. And I love hearing that from this community tonight. I want to talk to you about we only gave her one minute. That was all. Yeah, was last 20, 20, 20, 20 minutes. minutes. The time period to 20 minutes. Well, can we what? just, can we, I, I think that's wrong. No, that's, yeah. I'm sorry. We're it's 20 minutes. The, you started it, so let her finish. Her finish. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. So, just a reminder, it's something that we do have to keep track of time and, and respect the, uh, the rules that we have. So it's nothing personal. We very much appreciate all your comments, especially the students. Uh, this is why we're here, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to items for report, discussion, and possible action. 8A is report, discussion, and possible action to approve the public disclosure of the collective bargaining agreements with... AFT Local 1494 in accordance with AB 1200, GC 3547.5. Did you want to present anything on this? Uh, we have Ms. Kara here. Kara, did you want to share anything? It did run through, uh, as we explained in the past, when we do negotiate, it's uh, a whole new system. The district is beholden to be able to demonstrate that the school can afford that raise. So, and that includes the AB 1200 which means that they have to show what the raise, the impact on the raise on this current year's budget, but not only this year, next year, the two years out. So next year and the year after that. And this was put into place, I think in the 1990s, thank you, Oakland, because um, Oakland went bankrupt. And so that kind of, uh, they said, we don't want districts to be bankrupt. So they put in the safety measure. And, you know, it's it's a, it's good. It's, it's, it's making sure that the board is having and the governance team that we're being uh, fiduciary responsible. And so, yeah, we're pleased to, to, that we were able to provide a significant raise for our staff and um, we're able to afford it. That's even better. So, yeah, and I want to thank our union presidents that are both here Elizabeth Hartmuth from CSCA and Chris Wheeler from AFT. Do you guys want to give a speech? <laughs> but thank you. Timing on that was creepy. AI. AI. Anyway. All right.
right, so uh, agenda item 8A, are there any, uh, we do have uh, one public comment from Amber McKnight for 8A. Psycho, sorry. Well, no, we're not doing that. Okay, yeah. perfect, thank you. Um, board members, any uh, comments or questions on that item? No. Okay, so we do need to make a motion to approve it, correct? Yes. I make a motion yes, that, that we uh, approve uh, this disclosure and collective bargaining agreement. Okay, we have a second, and we'll go ahead and put the vote. All in favor? All right. Okay, great. All ayes. Uh, we'll skip 8B. It was removed from the agenda. 8C, report discussion and possible action to approve the CEQA exemption for temporary portables project. Uh, that was mentioned by uh, Mr. Savage earlier. Uh, there's the document. Uh, we will not read the whole thing. If you want to read it at home, go for it. Uh, and I make a motion that we approve this. Uh, LOE. Okay. We'll go ahead. All in favor? All in favor. Any other discussion or questions? Okay. Eight. Uh, sorry. Rodney Zeiss, did you have some comments on that agenda item before we move on? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Al. <coughs> just, <Sorry. coughs> just want to point out, just trying to keep it up in mind, and point something out. So we're talking about moving to portals because he's rushing up. Okay. And I'm just pointing something out that I've said I'm going to all the meetings and attending, and I kept my mouth shut. This is popped in the first thing when I heard it from, into the, from the portables. You have an ex, you have two offices you're using. You only need one. Why well, you have to put two portables? I mean, I thought of this the first day when it was brought up, and I'm like, I'm just kind of watch what you guys are doing. But you literally have two offices. All you have to do is figure out one, make it smaller, and you come up with a new classroom. I just want to bring it up to you. I'm, I'm starting to say things, but this is something to me, and I think it was brought up once by somebody else, but this is something common sense. And I'm just letting you know, I'm watching what's going on in the school. You're going to know things I don't know. Every one of you know something I don't know in the school. But I also know things you guys don't know. So I'm just pointing it out. Something I saw a long time ago. Simple solving situation. Emergency situation. <laughs> You can use the bond money, fix the door on the right-hand side if you have to. You can actually even use that as a classroom or the main office. You can go either way. I just want to bring it up to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 8D, and we do have a few public comments for 8D. Report discussion and possible action <coughs> to approve resolution 22-2023-20. Public comments by board members acting in their personal capacity and not at the direction of the governing board. So this is amended slightly from our last meeting. And just for clarity, this is not a resolution changing our bylaws. It essentially says we've got these bylaws and we're resolving to follow it and to clarify how we're going to try to uh, keep in following with it. So I will go ahead and read that. <clears throat> Whereas bylaw 9010 of the governing board, the board of the Snow Glen Unified <laughs> School District, the district provides among other things that all public statements authorized to be made on behalf of the board shall be made by the board president or, if appropriate, by the superintendent, principal, or designee, or other designated representative. Whereas by law 9010 further provides that when speaking to community groups, members of the public or the media, individual board members should recognize that their statements may be perceived as reflecting the views and positions of the board and that board members have a responsibility to identify personal viewpoints as such and not as the viewpoint of the board. Whereas bylaw 9200 of the board provides, among other things, that the governing board recognizes that the board is the unit of authority over the district and that a board member has no individual authority and that board members shall hold the education of students above any partisan principle, group interest, or personal interest. And whereas in light of the foregoing, the board believes it is in the best interest of the board and the district to adopt the following resolutions. <coughs> now, therefore, let it be resolved that in furtherance of bylaws 9010 and 9200, individual board members shall make clear when speaking to community groups, members of the public, 
for the media when such remarks are not on behalf or on behalf of or at the direction of the board here and after personal remarks that the views expressed are their own and not the views of the other members of the board. The board as a whole, the district, the superintendent principal or the teachers, staff or other employees of the district. And further resolve that members of the board are encouraged to preface their personal remarks before community groups, members of the public or the media with a disclaimer making clear the personal nature of their comments, such as by way of example and not limitation, the following. My statements represent my personal views and I am not speaking for or on behalf of the Simone Glen Unified School District, its governing board or its employees. So any discussion before we have comments from the public? Or would we like to have a discussion after the comments from the public? I would have comments from the public, yeah. Okay. So we'll go ahead with comments from the public. First, we have Ms. Erin Schoen, followed by David Selinger, and then Linda Harrelson. And I'll go from there. Thank you all for having me. It's always uh, um, <clears throat> pleasure to speak here. I am a Sonolian and I am also a parent of multiple children at this school. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a lot more than that. <laughs> I want to start off by just reminding everyone here and also those who are watching that parents and stakeholders at our school have a right and actually an obligation to provide feedback to our elected board. Um, to the members and that feedback should not be characterized as bullying that is something that just i don't want to see continue at these board meetings good partnership thrives on communication and that is the only way that understanding can be sought and cooperation achieved so last month linda we kind of discussed you speaking at the san ramon board meeting and you defended your intent which i understand but you were kind of also ignoring the result and that's what I wanted to bring up. The result of your public statements were that they were perceived as if they were comments from directly our district. And that really upset a lot of parents. And so we feel that you had a responsibility as the best interest, interests of the families and the children at this school, that instead of defending your position and things you said, but just acknowledging the parents' concerns that way we can create an environment of trust and cooperation with them. So last month I spoke on behalf of 41 parents who were um, upset about what had happened and who were just asking you to correct your statements um, with just a statement of clarification and apology, not necessarily a defense. So those parents really did feel dismissed last month. And I'm here again, offering you the opportunity to extend the olive branch and make a statement to help rebuild that trust with the parents. So the proposed um, resolution goes very far to identify what we would like. Voting for that is a really good start. But um, if you can find it to make any kind of public statement to kind of clarify that and really start to mend the bond um, between you and the parents and everyone involved, that would go a long way. Thank you, everyone. How do you do? I'm David, and uh, in the spirit of my last comment about being transparent, uh, I'm I'm the person that sent this to the board with the request to uh, to move forward with this resolution at the last board meeting. For those of you that were not in attendance, uh, uh, Trustee Jurgensen, President Jurgensen, pointed out that uh, that he felt like it was a little bit punitive in its nature. And uh, so in that same spirit of, of what Aaron just put forward, uh, I put this forward as my proposed uh, compromise. I also sent a letter to the board, which I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen. I hope you have read. And it, it's effectively that I find myself in a very awkward position. As a, as a pretty conservative person myself, I find myself <laughs> in, in this situation aligned with a bunch of kind of left-wing hippies. And, uh, so is that, sorry, is, that, hey, is hey. this on the record? No derogatory. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a compliment. Oh, um, sorry. But, uh, but it, it's odd to me, right? Like, I, I am a person of law and order. I believe that the laws are what create the opportunity for the diversity of opinions, the diversity of religion that makes America an amazing country. 
And when we don't follow those laws, that's where all of that collapses. We do not have the space to have our opinions heard. We do not have the space to elect our officials and to hold them accountable. As, as Aaron said, holding an elected official accountable is part of the job. Let's go, Brandon took about 35 seconds to start hitting the scene in America. Just after four years of, of my party saying, hey, we're treating uh, Trump like the worst president ever. No one has ever treated a president this badly. And then that was the immediate subsequent move. It's, it's em embarrassing where we are going with this. That's not bullying. You're an elected official. You are an elected official. And it is incumbent, as, as Aaron said, a responsibility of the populace to express their opinions and to share those with you. That is, again, not bullying. I am a person of law and order, as my letter stated to the board. It is black and white that what was done in San Ramon does violate the law, but I don't care about that. What I care about is going forward, as Aaron said, in the spirit of moving this school, this community, the set of students forward so that we can hopefully heal those wounds, extend an olive branch, agree to obey the rules so that we can embrace the diversity of opinions, religions, beliefs, gender going forward. Thank you. Yes, Linda Carlson. Oh, my name is Harmison. Harmison, sorry, I read that incorrectly. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, so uh, this is a very interesting conversation and I will have to out myself and say that I'm not from Sonoma. I live in Pleasanton and like Tammy, she has fun with FEMA. <laughs> Oddly enough, I have fun with CBOX. And uh, I also have to tell you that 2019 was not a good year for me. Um, I had two medical disabilities. And then there was this funny thing called COVID. And to get um, help was very difficult, especially in physical therapy. But here, the blessing was webinars. I could attend any meeting in the state or the country and start learning. Because when you have two medical dis disabilities, my brain went to mush. And so um, I don't have children. I don't have any stake except that I pay property taxes. And I would tell you, what I see in the school districts is that they have problems. Drugs, absenteeism, um, declining enrollment, um, you know, and they don't like to talk about it because they have to admit that it's a problem. But I like this gentleman here. I like to step in and help where I can. So what's interesting is what brought me here was I was at the San Ramon meeting I worked in uh, for IBM in San Ramon. Uh, I, I, I know lots of people in that community and I went to that meeting. It was very, very interesting. Um, I, I don't go to, guess what? I don't go to Pleasanton Unified School District meetings, but I've started to because I found out they have a board policy committee. They have a curriculum committee. I went and asked them, what do you do? What do you talk about? Um, and so the San Ramon was highly uh, volatile. There were media there. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll divert from that. But the only thing, <laughs> let me just say the one astounding thing was the woman who was an educator and got up and said, let's push all of this aside and talk about the appropriateness of the books. You know, you can order from Amazon if you want. Them. Uh, you know, but I'm not here to debate that. But I also will tell you, I applied for the CBOC. You don't have to live in the district to be on the CBOC committee. Um, I've been, you know, studying those. And the other reason is Pleasanton Unified School District has, what, 15 schools? You guys only have one. I'm intrigued by 270 students, 200 are from Fremont. How does this bond thing work? But the interesting thing is I need to get a to get around. Can you imagine me going out for a survey for 15 schools? But anyway. Uh, right. So the interesting thing is I looked at your handbook for um, Board of Trustees. When I first got it, I got to the pages organizational chart. The time's it is, up, sorry. It's out of date. 
Thank you. Okay. Linda Senator. I'm going to pass. Okay, thank you. Uh, Margie Corey. My name. I attended the last board meeting and I was quite astounded and it bewilders me that there can be so many parents that are so upset about a person who I've known for a very long time. And I can tell you that this person, you should be glad that she's on this board because she will represent the community very well. She will hold the, the board accountable. She will make sure that the funds that the Sunol member, the Sunol community is paying for through the taxes for this particular school that your kids are attending will be, will be appropriately applied. And I say to all of you that you need to calm down and you need to let her do her job because she'll, she's an excellent person. I mean, you should, I can't even, she's an amazing person. I trust her. I feel that she will do a great job on this board. Give her a chance and stop, stop nitpicking is what I see. I see this nitpicking and it's disturbing to me that this community has reached this level. It's really bothersome. So I'm asking all of you to calm down, let Linda do her job and you'll be surprised. You'll even probably thank her because she's an amazing person. So I want to say, this isn't only about um, that you shouldn't talk about uh, being on the board. <clears throat> this is about trying to shut out reasonable conversation. After the lengthy attack that took place at the last meeting, I was hoping this issue was behind us. The points were made very clearly. The board member was put through repeated abuse and disingenuous presentation. She agreed to be more careful in the future. That was punishment enough. The, reson the resolution itself now seems to mimic what's already on the books and by the group of people bringing it up again, even in its modified form demonstrates a deep and dark desire for punishment against the only female board member any way they can get it. So even though you took her name out of it, by supporting it, you keep bringing her name back into it. And it's bullying. It is bullying. Yes, it's bullying. It's bullying. All right, Not next bullying. is Mr. Bob Froman. Good evening, everybody. My name is Bob Frillman. Uh, I'll start with street cred. Uh, my family's lived here in St. for 40 years. Uh, we've been very, very supportive of the school over the years. I was one of the evil cabal that uh, fought against Measure J for a number of personal reasons. It has nothing to do with the few hundred dollars a year it will add to my tax bill. There were some other issues, transparency issues, that I found fault with. Uh, I wasn't going to come tonight. And in spite of my position against Measure J, Andrew keeps me on his mailing list. So I was able to, I was able to read a letter that was sent in by a member of the community. Uh, that letter included a, a statement that they wanted the, this board to censure Linda Hurley, who a, a, has been a friend for many, many years. And when I read that, I thought, what is going on here? As long as we all stood up and put our hand on our heart and pledged allegiance to that flag to censure her or to throttle her free speech goes contrary to every single thing about that. Every single thing, regardless of the rules that you guys make up. Those are the ones that count. That's the ones that count. And that's all I'll say about it. it, it you've got a person here. Uh, who who loves this school, uh, has had kids that have attended the school. She will work her tail off to make sure that this school thrives. And if if reasonable questioning 
of actions by other members of the board is something that people don't like, get over it. You need to become a child of the 60s and question authority is what I'll say. I'd like to make one final comment. The young lady who gave the, the very emotional <clears throat> speech uh, earlier, the reason that the issue in question was on the agenda, difficult, unsavory, unpopular things need to be discussed. They need to be put out there. They need the full light of day to be either adopted or thrown away. And thank God we threw it away, but but that's the reason it was on there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Keep it down back there. All right. That's all of our public comments for 8D. Uh, are there any comments from board members? Well, I started out having a a response to a lot of the the mudslinging, and I feel actually that many wrongful, inaccurate, and mean-spirited things have been said about me and what my intentions are. And my intentions have been very different than those that have been publicized. I love this school and I love children, always have. I ran a nursery school for six years and I've taught and I've been involved with nursing and, and I, I love people. Um, when I talked in San Ramon, it wasn't for a friend. I, I did so for a friend. And, and let's get this, this was February. I'd been sworn in in December. There's a very sharp learning curve to all the things you have to learn here. And I did take the master's of governance class. And, um, you know, I didn't think about stating that I was not representing the school. It didn't even occur to me. I wasn't saying anything that I thought was representing the school. I thought it was pretty darn clear that these were my opinions. And I was reaching out to the board that was there and saying, we are dealing with the same issues. You know, we're, we're, all here to serve our constituency and the children that we you know are representing so it didn't even occur to me that i was representing it will from here on out for sure point taken but um i also have been accused of lying about uh, a board a committee a parent committee that adopts our library books and i had heard Marlene say something that led me to believe we had this parent committee that shows the library books here so i did um mention that we had a committee and and apparently i was mistaken i did in fact text Marlene that very night about five minutes after i left here and said i didn't realize that you know, you hadn't said that. I That was my understanding. And she just gave me a thumbs up at the time and then said she hadn't heard that. So there was no intentional lie. There was just a misunderstanding. Um, I do want to apologize for those people that took this badly. There certainly was no ill intent. And um, I hope, you know, when when we are tearing it apart at one another and a lot of the, the letters to the editor were really nasty and and again they credit me with intentions i did not have um this tears it hurts me but it also hurts our community it really has hurt our community contention reinforces the false notion that confrontation is the way to resolve differences it never is contention is a choice and I have always been open to discussing civilly with anybody what your views are, what your thoughts are. I'm completely open to, I went to Berkeley. My mom was a Democrat. My dad was a Republican. We had very interesting discussions at home. And so I do feel, even though I am more conservative than otherwise, I'm not totally, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I'm, I'm completely open to discussing, you know, open ideas. and. My heart goes out to people who are struggling with these issues. The reason I put 8B or, or part of it, the 1314 on there, was to discuss because schools across the nation right now 
have teachers and schools that are getting caught in the crossfire of this. And somewhere down the road, it may happen here, I don't know, but there are lawsuits on either sides. The teachers are damned if they do or damned if they don't when it comes to sharing things with the parents. And so I just, I wanted to have a civil conversation, but we can't have that in this community. I don't think so. So I won't be putting anything like that again. We could have, if we wanted to have the author of, of that bill come and describe things, let's, but I don't think we should. To, uh, so that's, I don't know if I addressed your concerns, Erin. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. And I was going to make the motion that we accept this, right. this resolution, and I, hope that I can have a better relationship with Mr. Romo, Romo. Romo going forward. That gentleman. Well, I'm a little nervous. Thank you. Don't be there. <laughs> I will say that I uh, appreciate that you apologize for um, the statements. I think that takes a lot of um, strength of character, and I appreciate that. I think that parents here appreciate that too. Uh, I think the policy, or sorry, the resolution um, is as we talked about last time, and I think it's reflective again this time that it is a, a forward looking uh, resolution with respect to how all of us um, should interact uh, in public. And I think that was the intention, and I think it still stands, and I think it's worth seconding and, and voting on. Great. So we've got a motion, we have a second. Um, and before we vote, I will just say, um, I think we're we're all trying our best. And uh, so we do resolve that we will continue to try to follow these bylaws and to not misrepresent the board, ourselves, or the community. So uh, we'll go ahead and vote all in favor. Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Item 8E, report discussion, possible action to approve the contract with Underwood and Rose Bloom, civil engineers and surveyors for topographic and boundary survey with utility locating services for the Measure J bond projects at Samoa Glen School. And we do have one public comment from Mr. Rod. Never mind. We do not have any public comments. We got through all of them. And then, uh, is there anyone who would like to make any comments from the board on this fee proposal for topographic survey? I have no comments. Okay. Approve. Okay, I second the motion to approve. All in favor, aye. Aye. Great. Item 8F, report discussion, possible action item to approve the contract with ZFA, structural engineers for Sonol Glen School main building structural evaluation <coughs> and preliminary seismic rehabilitation drawings. Thank you again, Mr. Savage, for explaining this earlier. I make a motion that we approve, unless there's any comments. I do have one comment on this one. Please. Um, while I'm in favor of moving forward with this one, I would ask that you have, before you sign it, you strike the provision that provides for a contingent guarantee. It's a personal guarantee by the secretary. Um, oh. It not be in there. <laughs> Bill, what are you doing to me? <laughs> but, so what we would do is we would do a uh, independent consultant agreement that's a district form and the proposal is attached for reference only and is not a part of the contract. Right, so long as it's clear that the guarantee is not going to be put. That's correct, yes. Okay, okay. you got that right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. How's <laughs> 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 that? I want to have a lawyer that things are. Thank you, Ken. Perfect. Second. And yeah. all favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Uh, 8G, report okay. discussion, possible action item to approve the Sonoma Glen Unified School District parent guardian request for other pre-approved absences. Any discussion? All right, the motion that we approve? Second. All right, and all in favor, aye. 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 Great. 
And now, home stretch, consent items. A, we're going to do it all at the same time. A, approval of minutes, April 4, 2023. April 25, 2023. Approval of warrants, dated 3 27 23. Warrants dated 4 5 23 and 4 17 23. Approval of personnel documents, May 2023. Agreement for legal services between. 3F LLP, I think what it was called, Snow Glen Unified School District 2324, service agreement between Park Corp LLC and Snow Glen Unified School District. A motion that we approve all of those consent items. Second. All right. Any discussion? Okay. And all approved? Aye. Aye. Great. Uh, calendar. Our next board meetings, we hope to see you all here. It's been way more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, June 13th, put it on your calendar. And we are lucky we get two meetings in June so that we don't get to enjoy summer too much. June 27th also. But in July, there is no meeting. All right. I motion that we approve those calendar meetings. All through. Aye. Aye. Great. Closing comments. Any closing comments from Trustee Hurley? I think I'm on. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any closing comments from Trustee Hurley? I do. Um, I want to uh, just, for the record, make clear that with respect to the provision relating to transgender um, disclosure um, to parents, I am not in favor of that. Um, I categorically believe it's wrong, and I think it's important that you know, we support people such as Rihanna Baskinski. Uh, it's important that schools be uh, open and safe places for students, um, especially if, as I think it's uh, known in the Trevor Project's 2022 national survey found that only a third of identified uh, transgender youth uh, felt their homes were a gender affirming place. So that's two thirds are potentially at risk. And I think that schools have an obligation to protect the charges that they have and not to disclose uh, in that context. With that in mind, I think I also would like to point out that I think that uh, the comment that was made by um, Bob Frillman, um, that, you know, that there is a need to shine the light of day on things like AB 1314, uh, provisions like that, that may be coming through. Um, and I think he said, thank God it was thrown away. Um, I will second that. And I will agree with that because I think that is true. We should all be vigilant about these things and we should make sure that they don't come to light. Um, without a knockdown and putting them in their place. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for tonight. It was pretty, it was a heavy day. It's been a heavy couple of weeks. And uh, what I, I love that a couple of people were noting that, you know, what we worked really hard to do is to continue to protect our children be vigilant about that mm -hmm. and so that even though we're adults and we're having this conversation i agree that there needs to sometimes we need to have healthy conversation the first priority for everybody in this room is our children and for them to feel safe and what all that that means i also just want to share on behalf of the sonoglin staff um we did want to express our encouragement moving forward to maybe pause if there are, we are trying, I, I really feel proud of the way this meeting is going here at the end. And I can see that there's emotions. I can see that there's a desire in all three of our board members of really wanting to be a more cohesive. That's cohesive boards do better things for kids. There's there's research that shows that boards that are dis, at dissension aren't able to move forward with an agenda that s serves kids. So it's really critical that we work hard as a government's team on ourselves and that we're committed to that. And I think that um, the three of you being fairly new on the board and remembering that Snow Glen was the only school in Alameda County, yay, that got flooded. And the work involved, I know, the, the award we didn't want, 
the work involved in that is so exhausting. And the goal is to get the students back into their programs and the teachers not yeah. in art and here. Uh, that is critical. I have working with Bill, he, we're streamlining, we're moving, we're trying to get that. And at this critical juncture, this might not be the best time to bring in assembly bills that aren't necessarily impacting our school. If it's something that I, we, there's an assembly bill about TK, that impacts our school. We might want to talk about that and how what does that impact our school? Because that's more kids that, that directly impacts our school. But some other ones on behalf of our staff, we're all the teachers and all the classified staff. We we had a conversation and we said, golly, we really wish the board would maybe calm down on those items at this time. Uh, please keeping in mind that the flood and that impact and all the work that's there, there's plenty of work. That needs to be all of our focus and attention. We ask that you join us in staying focused on positivity, kindness, and providing a wonderful, wonderful learning environment for our amazing students. Thank you, Molly, for representing the, the teachers and staff and uh, sharing that. Um, to clarify a couple of items that were brought up uh, from the community, we do hear you, we read your letters, we do listen, um, and we care about the school. A uh, couple of things were brought up about the election. We don't run the election, the county does, so we don't really have any way to change anything or question that. The oversight committee is doing their thing. Um, we're glad we have them. We've got people to do oversight on the bond. Uh, we will try to continue to have good transparency. Um, kind of with that, with the oversight committee, the oversight committee has publicly available meetings and they're open. You can go, you can hear I from attended. them. I promise right. you. It's there you go. You were in our audience. So, <laughs> so, all, so anybody out there who is concerned about not knowing who the oversight committee members are, what they do, what they stand for, et cetera, et cetera, what their rules are, should go to their meetings and participate as as you are allowed to and, and you have yes. every right to. Yes. Thank you. The, that that meeting is open as well. It will not be nearly as fun as this meeting, but <laughs> <laughs> um, the okay. as far as transparency also, goes, we can also have we'll try be, sorry. It's also required to be under so, the Brown Act, which surprised me. Okay. So, so, so we're, we're gonna go ahead and try to be more transparent with agenda items and maybe include a little more information about why it's there especially things that would potentially be upsetting to people. We'll try to do better. We're sorry if that transparency and information wasn't there. Um, we, let's see, there were a couple others that I wanted to quickly uh, include. I love the, the comments about inclusion and kindness and being here for all students. Um, And thank you again to everyone who shared their opinions and ideas. Uh, let's see. I, I mean, you all here on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you kept me here for four hours. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more minutes, I get to say a couple things. Uh, thank you for attending the meetings. And yes, I agree with the idea of calming down. Um, on all sides, if we can try to have a little more civility, kindness in the way that we talk about it. The irony is sometimes people say we want kindness, but it doesn't feel very kind. So let's try to work on that and calming down uh, on both sides. And when items are brought up that maybe are sensitive, do it in a more gentle way. Um, and my kids saw me wear this tie a few weeks Snow ago and they said dad that's Snow Glen colors you got to wear that to the next board meeting so this is now my although it's from my my uh men's chorus uh undergraduate uh school I, it now can be like a Snow Glen tie also wait you you're singing us out i'm not gonna yeah, sing wow. no I heard, <laughs> I heard that, right? um we do want a Snow Glen to be a safe place for all kids and all opinions um and, and I, I appreciate that. Although coming into this meeting, I thought it would be horrible. It ended up as a discussion, hearing each other and, and things went well. Thank you for following the rules, the time, that sort of thing. Um, and part of the reason my four children are at this school is because I trust the educators. 
Um, I don't need to come in here and watch what they're doing every single day because I trust them. I, I like them. I think they're doing a great job. So thank you to the educators in this school. Um, the, the, board, the board is here to try to help and not to be a burden. And so that's what we're trying to do. Um, we, we, we love and, expect, and, and accept all people. We would like kindness to be preached and continue to be preached here. And we will keep that up. And thank you again for all coming. We, we enjoy seeing your faces. Wait, wait, last thing. Oh. How about our students? Hey! All right, and we'll go ahead and close our meeting at 8.45. Yeah. Holy cow. Holy cow.